remain standing in heart or spirit uh, for the reading of the Word of God today. It comes out of the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 24, I know the bulletin says it starts in 26, but it was a typo. It's supposed to be 36 to 44. So hear now the Word of God. But nobody knows when that day or hour will come. Not the heavenly angels and not the Son. Only the Father knows. As it was in the time of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the human one. In those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. They didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them all away. The coming of the human one will be like that. At the time, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know what day the Lord is coming. But you understand that if the head of the house knew at what time the thief would come, he would keep alert and wouldn't allow the thief to break into his house. Therefore, you also should be prepared because the human one will come at a time you don't know. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be gracious and glorious to you. For you are a rock and our redeemer. Amen. So let's start this morning by playing a little game. It's called, What is Older? There's going to be two images on the screen, and what I want you to do is I want you to point to which side of the screen you think has the older object, person, or whatever. All right, so you ready? Let's play, What is Older? So here on the screen you see we have Betty White and sliced bread. So point to the side you think is older. All right, the answer is... Betty White is older than sliced bread. 1922 and 1928. All right, so next we have have our first original building here at Milford Hills, what we call now the Fellowship Hall, which used to be our sanctuary, and the phrase, one nation under God in our Pledge of Allegiance. So which do you think is older? All right. I can see you all. Some of you aren't participating in this fun game that I've created. (laughs) So raise your hands high and point to which side you want. I want to see who's right and wrong. Daryl doesn't want to make a decision. He's just going, both of them are. All right, the answer is one nation under God is slightly older than our first building. All right, next we have the creation of the United Methodist Women and the creation of our national park, which the first one was Yellowstone. Which one is older? This is not a a speak out loud choir. This is a point. (laughs) I can't see them, so you all hold them accountable. All right, the answer is United Methodist Women by two years. 1869 is when United Methodist uh, Women was created, or that formed what then turned into United Methodist Women. They celebrated 150 years two years ago. Uh, Yellowstone was the first national park, but that didn't happen until 1871. Next we have the Christmas Conference. For those who are not uh, you know, deep uh, Methodist historians, the Christmas Conference was the first conference here in the United States. And at that conference, Coke and Asbury were ordained in the Methodist denomination was basically started here in America, or the Declaration of Independence. All right, y'all are getting it, but uh, let's see what it is. The Declaration of Independence is by just a few years. However, the start of the Methodist denomination is older than our Constitution. Next, we have John Wesley himself or the idea of the rapture. Which one is older? Someone's calling in with the answers. So, let's see. 
John Wesley is older by almost a hundred years. So this is a fun little game that we played, and uh, it's because and it's remarkable because I did this because we have some things in our thoughts and our views and our aspects and our culture that seem like they've been that forever, but in reality, it hasn't been that long. I mean, who knew that Betty White is going to celebrate a hundred years because you know she's going to be eternal and live forever before the invention of sliced bread. If you were in school before 1954, when you said the Pledge of Allegiance, you did not say the phrase, one nation under God. However, these things seem to have a deep, deep root in our culture. And they do so, they seem to be long-standing traditions that we just get accustomed to. And so we think it's been like that forever. The same thing is true with the idea of the rapture. It really hasn't been around as long as I'm guessing many of you have thought it is. This term and idea is really only 150 some odd years old, but it is so ingrained in our Christian culture here in America, it kind of makes it hard to talk about because it seems like it has been around since Jesus. I told you last week I was going to disrupt some of your ideas about the end times, and I'll be honest, I took it easy on you last week. You know, it's mentioned that, you know, we don't turn into angels when we get into heaven. That was those were kind of light stepping on toes. Hopefully you brought your steel boots today, because this week I'm going to confront one of the hardest topics, because it's so deeply rooted into our culture that most of us think it just has to be true. In my 19 years of ministry, I've only preached about this a few times, and it's scary to hit people in their gut when it comes to what they believe. However, I've come to realize, especially after our N.T. Wright study group where we looked at the book Surprised by Hope, that if I don't... I'm perpetuating bad theology, and it goes against my calling and my duty as your pastor. So, here's the rule, please. Don't walk out of worship right now. Don't turn off your device of however you are participating in worship. Stick with me as we go on this journey, please. But here's the reality. I do not believe in the rapture. Back in 1994 at West Charlotte High School, I was a senior, and I was able to take an elective on the Bible. It was an overview course taught by a Baptist preacher who was also a carpenter who also then led this Bible class in a public school in the middle of Charlotte. Looking back, that was kind of weird, but this was my first biblical teaching beyond what I learned in Sunday school or at youth group. We learned all about the Bible, went from Genesis all the way to Revelation in that year, and was spectacular when we got to that book of Revelation. He gave us this big map that we unfolded and went through chapter by chapter of how each section kind of was understood and what we can look for in in each of those chapters. And we talked about the beast with seven heads and horns and he shared how barcodes, they have longer lines on them and each of those uh, lines represent a number but the longer lines actually means six, and so there's three of them on a barcode, and which could be the sign of the beast because it's 666, which, you know, everything we purchase uses a barcode. We talked about the Battle of Armageddon and the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and I remember at the end of that course, as a senior in high school, I felt like I'd been given the tools to, co- to uncover the secrets of God. I was ready to go out into the world to, to look around it so I could know for certain when the end times were coming and what the signs were. I brought my newfound knowledge to youth group and pushed back on some of my teachings that my youth counselors were giving us. One of them, who is now a pastor in our own conference, said to me, we often associate the first things we learn about revelation as truth and close our minds to all other options. He was exactly right. When I went off to college and to seminary and finally got some other biblical teaching, my eyes were then opened to a different way of interpreting scripture than when it was when I was in high school in that trailer right outside. My eyes were open further to see the truth about our culture and our American views of scripture, and my personal belief started to change. The big moment that changed my view on the book of Revelation and the ideas of the rapture were learning about a person named John Darby. John Darby was an extremely smart Irishman who was born in London. 
He went to Trinity College in Dublin and was an, and excelled in his biblical studies. In the mid-1830s, he started to travel around Ireland and England with this movement called the Plymouth Brethren. And during his travels, he lectured and, and began to get a reputation about being a wonderful interpreter of biblical prophecy. These different ideas of biblical prophecy formed a new theology called dispensationalism. There's going to be a couple $5 words here, so just kind of hang with me. So John Darby is known as the father of dispensationalism. And let me kind of just highlight very quickly, because, you know, we don't want to be here for six days learning about all this stuff, but so let me just hit some very quick highlights about this theology. And my hope is, is that I, as I do, you can kind of get a sense of some of the grip that it has on our American Christian culture, especially when it comes to common eschatology or the belief about the end times. So here's a little broad summary of one of their core de- beliefs. Dispensationalism, as it is defined by Wikipedia, says a hermeneutic system, which hermeneutics means a method of interpretation. So it is a hermeneutical system for the Bible. It considers biblical history as divided by, uh, God, divided by God into dispensations, defined periods of, or ages to which God has allotted distinctive administrative principles. According to dispensationalism, each age of God's plan is thus administered in a certain way, and humanity is held responsible as a steward during that time. So the, the method of interpretation, or the hermeneutic, finds seven different periods within the Bible, and now even some different denominations look at that slightly differently. But Darby came up with these dispensations because he also believed in what is called a literal hermeneutic. So remember that $5 word, hermeneutic, means the way we interpret Scripture. So Darby looked at Scripture literally, and you can see that all around our culture too. This means that he believed that the Bible should be interpreted according to the plain meaning conveyed by its grammatical construction and historical context. To put it another way that I've heard people throughout my years of ministry say it is the Bible says it and I believe it. Because they believe in taking the Bible literally in every part, as they look at some of the writings in Daniel or Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation, they see it as literal and that those things will definitely be happening. They then look at these texts that were read today and say that there is a moment when a trumpet will sound, and then all of a sudden people will vanish and be called up to be with God. Once again, this is too much for just one simple sermon, but let me address the literal hermeneutic, because I think it gets us into some deep trouble. This is one of those things that sounds good and kind of makes sense on the surface, but then it only goes puddle deep. What we have in our Bible are texts that are thousands of years old. The newest book of a Bible is over, well over 1,800 years old. There needs to be context for what we are reading. And beyond that, we don't read all of the Bible literally. If you have ever read uh, the rated R book of the Bible, the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, depending on your translation, this is what the woman literally looks like, if we would think. But that's not the case. I, I highly doubt that Solomon wrote this beautiful love letter to a woman who looks like that. Okay, you might be saying, well, Jim, that's poetry, that was a love letter. You're not supposed to read that literally. Well, let's look at Jesus then. If a person believes in a literal hermeneutic and comes up to me and professes that they take everything that is in the Gospels as literal, then what about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? In Matthew 5, Jesus talks about lust and says, starting in verse 27, "You You have heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you that every man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. And if your right eye causes you to fall into sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose a part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to fall into sin, chop it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose a part of your body than that your whole body go into hell. Now if we take the Bible literally then how did we survive adolescence with all of our body parts? How do we watch beer commercials in the 80s? Or 
survive the internet. Let's stop thinking we actually interpret the Bible 100% literally, because we don't, and nor should we. The Bible is made up of all different types of writing styles, historical books, wisdom literature, poetry, allegory, letters to certain people written at a certain time, and all that can't be boiled down to plain meaning. So there are many issues with this dispensational theology. But how did it get such a huge following here in America in the early part or in the early part of the 20th century? A lot of it has to be because of the 1909, the Schofield Reference Bible was released. And I am sure there are probably many of you or at least your family members who had a copy of this Bible because it was extremely popular. But this version of the Bible helped promote the dispensational theology. In its footnotes, it started or told you where the different dispensations started and stopped and pushed the idea of the rapture and a literal end-time eschatology. So that was happening, but then also you mix in the Bible Institute movement, which was happening right around 1880 to 1920, and all these uh, Bible schools were founded, like the Moody Bible Institute. But there was also a popularity of prophecy uh, conferences around the United States, too. These institutions and conferences latched on to this dispensational theology they professed it, they taught it, they, they spread it. If you watch many of the TV preachers we have these days, my guess is that they would have more in common with Darby and Schofield than they would with John Wesley, Martin Luther, or John Calvin, or many of the other Protestant theologians. Dispensationalism is bad theology, but it has a great hook, and it makes you feel like a high schooler who is given the keys to unlock the mysteries of the world. But that doesn't mean it's true. If this theology and hermeneutic is only 150 years old, and if most of the other Christians around the world, outside the United States, don't believe in it, then what should we believe? Let's look at the historical understanding of these two pieces of scripture that were read today. First Thessalonians. It's probably one of the most that people quote when they talk about the rapture. However, you are only looking at a puddle deep if you think it refers to that. In this scripture, you have an image of Jesus coming down, something referred to in the Greek as the parousia, which simply means the second coming, which is what we believe in, yes. But in this early letter of Paul, he gives the image of Jesus coming down from heaven. There's a blast of God's trumpet, and those who are dead in Christ will rise again, and those who are still living and believe are are taken up, they're snatched up, they're caught up, depending on your translation, to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is the standard picture that we get of the rapture. But it isn't the rapture. This is the second coming of Christ. This is the parousia. I like how the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary talks about this image. They say the union will be glorious, not only because Paul uses the expression parousia, which connotes a grand affair, but it will be glorious as well because Paul uses the expression meeting, which at least connotes an entourage of citizens going out to meet a dignitary. This will be, at the second coming, a great and grand meeting, but where's the destination? In the idea of the rapture, the believers are pulled out of this world and taken away. But in this scripture, here Jesus is coming to earth, and the living believers are simply going out to meet him, to usher him into this new kingdom that will be here on earth. Back before GPS, my grandparents would come down from Ohio to visit. And they might tell us a you know, roundabout time that they hope to get there. I mean, we could do math. We're going to leave about eight. It takes about eight hours. We can figure out roughly what time they get there, but we didn't know back then if they hit traffic or needed to stop or whatever. They couldn't call us on their cell phones and say, hey, the GPS is telling me that our estimated time of arrival is about 545. And since we only saw them a few times a year, we waited with anticipation for their arrival. And when they did arrive, their car probably wasn't even turned off before we ran out of the door to go and greet them. We were excited to give them hugs, but We didn't stay outside. That wasn't 
their destination. Their destination was to come into the house and to visit. We were excited, so we went out to meet them and then welcomed them in. This is what this text is sharing, too. At Jesus' second coming, believers will go up to meet Jesus and welcome him into this new kingdom here on earth. That doesn't remove believers from earth, but actually keeps us here. We simply go out to meet and greet and bring and welcome Christ and his reign here on earth. In the Matthew text, we have another story. This one from Jesus himself about two men in a field and two women. This story isn't about the righteous being snatched away. Instead, as the New Interpreter's Commentaries puts it, the point is that in the present, the two men in the field and the two women grinding at the mill appear alike. But the parousia, the second coming, will disclose that one is saved and one is lost. It's similar to the the story of the sheep and the goats, which comes in the very next chapter, just a few verses away. Jesus starts this whole idea with saying, as it was in the time of Noah, so will be the coming of the human one. With the rapture, the idea is that the believers are taken out and those who didn't believe are left behind. However, that's not how the story of Noah goes. That's not the point of this parable either. We'll get into a little bit more in this final week of this series when we talk about the new heaven and the new earth and a little bit more on the book of Revelation in just two weeks. But what we need to know is that at the end times, that they'll happen, what will happen is found here in Matthew and is repeated in many other places. Verse 36 says, But no one knows when that day or hour will come, not the heavenly angels and not the Son, only the Father knows. We don't know when the parousia, when the second coming will happen. And the message today is to stop guessing. There won't be a rapture, a snatching away from us, from this world. The exact opposite is actually found in these two scriptures and elsewhere. At the parousia, at the end times, at the second coming, the believers will be here doing the work of kingdom building. The same work that we are called to do here and now. It is the work that is being defined by our resurrected Savior in the scriptures and in our hearts today. We are to be about kingdom building here on earth as it is in heaven. At the end time, our work isn't done. It's just merely beginning. God never promised to take us away from this calling. God instead invites us into a deeper relationship, deeper work, and deeper kingdom building. This is what we should be concentrating on, because we will not know the day or the hour. And so let's let's just be busy doing the work that we are called to do until that time comes. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks for who you are and who you call us to be. And so as we hear from different people's ideas of what the scripture means, may we learn also different interpretations so we can understand it deeper ourselves. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit which continues to work in us and through us to learn more about who you are and who you call us to be. For it is in your name we pray. Amen.